Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. We're here today to teach the lesson Rebellion in a Perfect Universe. We have Scott and Elisa as well teaching today, but before we begin, we need to ask for the presence of the Holy Spirit. Scott, could you lead us in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of studying your words. Thank you for this lesson. Thank you for the lessons we're about to learn. Um, we ask that you let your Holy Spirit guide our words and help us to be not rebellious, but submissive to your words and uh, to do and obey your will. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So we're going to start off with the memory verse today. Isaiah fourteen twelve. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, sun of the dawn. You have been cut down to the... which we don't really see until man falls, at least the full extent of it. But we see that in his creation as well. And we see that in how he saves us from eternal death. The second is the orig origin of sin, which we're going to cover today. There's no rhyme or reason to it There's as to how it came about or why it came about. But we're focusing today on the consequences that it bears upon us. The third one is um, Jesus on earth, the immaculate conception, Jesus being both God and man at the same time to solve the sin problem. And the fourth is the Trinity of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons, one God. We don't really have answers for any of these, but we do know, we do know that God points them out for a reason. And we see, we see some of these mysteries that we can at least know the result or the outcome from. We can't really comprehend them in this world. We probably won't be able to comprehend them in the next, at least not nearly as fully as God does, obviously. But today we're going to look at rebellion, or really sin, and how it all began. How the great controversy started. And we're going to look at three of those four mysteries and see how they do actually fit into the great controversy. Ellen White and Patriarchs and Prophets writes, The law of love being the foundation of the government of God. The happiness of all intelligent beings depends upon their perfect accord with its great principles of righteousness. God desires from all his creatures the service of love. Service that springs from an appreciation of his character. He takes no pleasure in a forced obedience. And to all he grants freedom of will that they may render him voluntary service. So long as all created beings acknowledge the allegiance of love, there was perfect harmony throughout the universe of God. It was the joy of the heavenly host to fill or fulfill the purpose of their creator. They delighted in reflecting his glory and showing forth his praise. And while love to God was supreme, love for one another was confiding and unselfish. There was no note of discard or discord or mar the celestial harmonies. But a change came over this happy state there was one who perverted that freedom that God had granted to his creatures. Sin originated with him who, next to Christ, had been most honored of God and was highest in power and glory among the inhabitants of heaven. Lucifer, son of the morning, was the first of the covering cherubs, holy and undefiled. He stood in the presence of the great creator and the ceaseless beams of glory and shrouding the eternal God rested upon him. Now, I love that first part before the sin because we will see that again someday. And we don't know, as we've mentioned, how sin entered a perfectly created being of Lucifer. But we know it could not have happened without freedom of choice. Ironic, isn't it? The very thing that is required to love God 
can also be the misguided path to rebellion against him. Rather than choosing to praise and glorify God, giving thanks for all God had done for him and the gifts Lucifer had received, he only thought of himself over time. It wasn't immediate, but it was a gradual change to where it was all about him. The title of this quarter study is On Death, Dying, and the Future Hope. We see in today's lesson how rebellion and ultimately death entered into the universe because of one angel's rebellion and the endurance and fortitude of that rebellion in his heart. It is a mystery, as we said before, how it entered his heart, but could Lucifer have repented? Yes, he could have. Could he have asked for forgiveness? There was a point in time where he had not crossed that line. But did he? No. We all, where we all see the power of pride in today's lesson as well. In this quarter's lesson, we will see the solution to the problem of death and sin. A plan of salvation with an agape love that we will marvel at throughout the ages forever. We read 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Wait, through who? Our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the answer to the sin problem. As death entered through rebellion, so the Son of God through the cross marked the death of death itself. For us, knowing that victory over death only comes through our Lord Jesus Christ, how could God love us so, another one of those mysteries, and pay such an infinite price for us that's beyond comprehension? As previous stated, it is that mystery. This quarter we will see what the consequences of rebellion to God are. Revelation 20, verses 9 through 10. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. We know that they don't actually burn forever. We know that they cease to exist. But once sin and rebellion are done away with, and perfect harmony will once again be restored in the universe, then God will, in Revelation 21, 4 through 7, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain, for the first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Don't you want to be his son? I can't wait until that part happens. We are studying today how in the past death entered into the universe, into our world. We are living during this time when our only hope is Christ Jesus and all that he's done for us. And we look forward to the future and those who trust in Jesus, follow in his ways and do his good pleasure. But most of all, for those who love God with all their heart and soul and mind and strength. What a day that will be when we can see him coming in the clouds. Scott, can you tell us about Sunday's lesson, creation and an expression of love? Certainly. So, on Sunday we discuss the idea of how God's creation is an expression of his love, which seems um, incomprehensible to me in the idea of God knowing the future. I'm thinking if I were God, I would have probably had a moratorium on creation until the sin problem was solved. 
because he would have been like, no, this is too much trouble. We'll just postpone their existence by a few thousand years. And so, uh, but apparently God loved us so much that he was willing to risk it. So let's, let's read about this. Nature in its present condition carries an ambiguous message that mingles both good and evil. Rosebuds can produce lovely and fragrant roses, but also harmful and painful thorns. A toucan can impress us with its beauty, then dismay us by assaulting the nests of other birds and eating their frail chicks. Even human beings who are capable of kindness in one moment can be vicious, hateful, and violent in the next. No wonder that in the parable of the wheat and tares, the servant asked the field owner, Sir, um, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And the owner replied, an enemy has done this. Uh, likewise, God created the universe perfect, but an, en an enemy defiled it with the mysterious seeds of sin. So then let's read John, 1 John 4, 7 and 8 and 16. So, uh, beloved, let us love one another for God, for love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not uh, know God, he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And then verse 16 says, And we have known and believed the love of, that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides uh, in love abides in God and God in him. And then it also reminded me, this reminded me of the um, time when Christ was speaking to uh, Simon um, one of the lepers who was cleansed, who was also a Pharisee, and he, he um, gave him a parable where two people were forgiven different amounts of money, and one was forgiven more than the other. So he said, who, who will love him the most? And he said, well, he who was forgiven the most. So I think we, as human beings, owe God uh, the greatest um, debt of love because he's forgiven us so much. Uh, so the other unfallen worlds um, didn't need to be forgiven because they, they didn't sin. So therefore, this has given us both. Uh, it's been both something that's been a blight on human existence, but also an opportunity to get closer to God. So uh, in this regard, we can um, count it as a blessing, even though it was meant as a bad thing. So... Um, and then I also wanted to touch on the fact that God wanted to create his beings capable of loving him back. And thus he had to endow them with free will so that they could give him love by choice. Um, this was so important to God that he was even willing to sacrifice his own son in order to allow for the development of love among his creation. God could have created beings which would not rebel against him and who would always obey. Um, he could have also obliterated Lucifer immediately after he fell and uh, saving himself and the universe much grief. However, in this case, some would have obeyed God out of fear. He could have also, um, my other thought is he could have reversed time and wiped out everybody's memory um, and then uh, done a takeover. So it'd be like, okay, you guys uh, try this again. Let's do a take two. Uh, however, God does not take shortcuts and he didn't do anything that was out of harmony with his character of love and truthfulness. Um, and now, the lesson also says, the fact that God is love conveys at least three basic uh, implications. First, uh, love by its very nature cannot exist um, in itself, but must be expressed. God's love is shared internally among the three persons of the Godhead and externally in his relationship with all his creatures. Second, all that God does is an expression of his unconditional and unchangeable love. This includes his creative works, his redemptive actions, and even the manifestations of his punitive judgments. Actually, God's love has been expressed in his justice no less than in his mercy. Justice is the foundation of his throne and the fruit of his love. And third, since God is love and all he does um, expresses his love. He cannot be the originator of sin, which is in direct opposition to his own character. 
but did God really need to create the universe? And I think this is back to my original question. Well, why couldn't God hold off on at least solving the sin problem? But he, he knows best, right? From the perspective of his loving nature, he wanted a universe as a means of expressing his love. And how amazing that he created some for forms of life, such as humans, not only to be capable of responding to his love, but also of sharing and expressing love, uh, not just to him, but to each other as well. So, um, th th there was another interesting part here about creation, which I thought was interesting. And in, in, in this way, I think, um, in my view, believing in a literal account of creation is important and that I think it expresses God's love more so than indefinite um, periods of time which were required for evolution. And there's a quote from Ellen White which kind of goes to, to show that. So it says, Millions of years, it is claimed, were required for the evolution of the earth from chaos. And in order to uh, accommodate the Bible to its supposed revelation of science, the days of creation are assumed to be vast, indefinite periods covering thousands or even millions of years. Such conclusion is wholly uncalled for. The Bible record is in harmony with itself and with the teaching of nature. On the first day employed in the work of creation is given the record. The evening and the morning were the first day. And the same in substance is said of each of the first six days of creation week. Each of these periods, inspiration declares, uh, have been a day consisting of an evening and a morning like every day since. In regard to the work of creation itself, the divine testimony is, He spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. With Him who could call into existence unnumbered world, worlds, how long of a time would be required for the evolution of the earth from chaos? In order to account for His works, must we do violence to His word? So, I think even the six-day creation week, uh, in my view, is a show of God's love. And this love is Satan is trying to get us to be confused and not see this by teaching people that this was vast, indefinite periods of time and that we sort of evolved out of, uh, basically out of dirt and rocks. So, anyway. God was very purposeful in all that he did. And actually in scripture also that word yom, mm -hmm. that's used for day, is never used symbolically or anything like that. It's always for a literal 24-hour day. Hmm. Thank you so, for that. Elisa, mm -hmm. free will, the basis for love. Okay. Well, Monday's lesson is about choice, our choice. Our freedom to choose or our free will is a gift from God given to us at creation. Just as God chooses to love us, we are free to love him and serve him or not. In 1 John 4.19, it says, We love him because he first loved us. Let's read what the Bible says about choice, love, and God in 1 John 4, 7 through 16. And it reads, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the appropriation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. 
And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. So Paul covers some main points here in, in this um, discussion about God's love. First of all, he says, God is love. It is his character to love. His choice to love us is a reflection of who he is. And then another, God expressed the depth of his love toward us by sending his son to die for us, taking our place and paying the penalty of sin for us so that we don't have to. And our ability to love is a gift from God. We cannot truly love God or others if we don't know and love God. This kind of love comes from God abiding in us and we in him. We express our love toward God by confessing him and loving others. This is a natural reflection of the love we have toward God. And finally, the love that God places in us is perfect, and it casts out fear. Now, many have wondered, and perhaps you as well, that if God is love, why did he permit sin? After all, it has resulted in much pain and suffering. Well, while we don't understand all the mysteries of the origin and nature of sin, we do know that it revolves around choice. The choice of who you will love, worship, and serve. Sin turns our focus inward and places ourself on the throne. Um, the memory text and, you know, reading further in Isaiah 14, 12 through 14, it gives us insight into Satan's mindset when he chose to rebel against God in heaven. And it reads, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the Most High. Satan allowed himself to become enamored with his own glory, the glory that God had given him when he was created. And then he began to covet the position, power, and glory of God. He cultivated these thoughts until they became full-blown rebellion and sin. There is a lesson and a warning here for us in that what we choose to dwell on our thoughts about our own abilities, rights, desires, can easily lead us down the wrong path, even as far as our own destruction. Conversely, if we believe God and choose to love and serve him, he will abide in us and produce his character in us. His character of love will call us to a much higher level of love and purpose. Jesus expressed this in Matthew 5, 43 to 48, and it reads, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you. Do get good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans do the same. And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans do so. 
Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Jesus then showed us the example through his persecution and death on the cross. Even during this terrible, unjust ordeal, Jesus trusted God the Father and forgave those who crucified him and asked the Father to forgive them as well. Have you ever shown this much love and grace toward others? Paul speaks of this in Romans 5, verses 6 to 11, and that reads, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ dies for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement." So in the face of such unfathomable love, what should be our response? Will we choose to love and serve him with much gratitude, or will we harden our hearts with ingratitude? On Tuesday, we'll talk about the mysteries, the mysterious ingratitude of Lucifer that resulted in sin. Byron, we'll hand that to you. All righty. Mysterious ingratitude. We're going to start off by reading Ezekiel 28, verses 12 through 15. Son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The ruby, the topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the lapis lazuli, and turquoise, and the emerald, and the gold and workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you. And actually, other versions like the King James say, the setting are your timbrels and pipes. And we'll come to that one later. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were the anointed cherub who covers, and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. As we discussed earlier, free will is needed to love God, but it's also needed to rebel against him, as you stated earlier. Lucifer was given everything, the highest among the angels, a covering cherub next to the throne of God, next to Christ, charged with protecting God's law. He was a guardian. In verse 13, the timbrels and pipes are believed to be um, for singing, like vocal cords. So that means he had two sets of vocal cords. He could sing like no one else. There was no angel like him in heaven. He was all that and then some, as we would say today. Unfortunately, Lucifer forgot who gave it all to him. And unrighteousness was found in him. I wonder what the byproduct of that unrighteousness was. We don't know how everything happened, but we can see some examples of the being sinless and then sinning in the Garden of Eden, for instance. And Ellen White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, Eve grew bolder when she saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree for, to be desired to make one wise. She took the fruit thereof and did eat. It was grateful to the taste, as, and as she ate, she seemed to feel a vivifying power and imagine herself entering upon a higher state of existence Without fear, she plucked and ate. And now, having her self transgressed, she became the agent of Satan and working the ruin of her husband in a state of strange 
unnatural excitement with her hands filled with the forbidden fruit, she sought in his presence and related all that had occurred. Now, we know that Lucifer, how should I put it? I'm sure that he probably thought something to where, how should I put it? He was better than everyone else. And he wanted, he longed for that point to be in Christ's position, but there was a certain time when he, that rebellion that God put up with because of his love and his mercy that it emboldened him. And I'm sure he had a similar feeling as Eve did to where there was that new territory he was entering on. And sin can be exciting like that, can it? At times, for those of us that have been out in the world. Um, but he failed to realize that that special right that belonged to the creator and the creator alone, he was created. And he was created for a purpose. And that purpose, God had placed him there. And this, now that this rebellion had taken root, we see that, well, we see the effects of it. And actually, if we read Patriarchs and Prophets after Eve meets Adam, after his transgression, Adam at first imagined himself entering upon a higher state of existence. But soon the thought of sin filled him with terror. The air, which had hitherto, hitherto been a mild and uniform temperature, seemed to chill the guilty pair. The love and peace which had been theirs was gone. And in its place they felt a sense of sin, a dread of the future, and nakedness of the soul. I would not doubt if Lucifer at some point felt the same thing, realizing at first it was exhilarating, as sin can be, but then realizing or beginning to realize the consequences of the road that he was going down. As I said, there was no place for him found in heaven because he was tainting it. So let's finish reading the results of Lucifer's rebellion in Ezekiel 28, 16 through 19. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence and you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you as profane from the mountain of God. And I've destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I put you before kings, and they made you see that they made you see or see you by the multitude of your iniquities and the unrighteousness of your trade. You profaned or I, you profaned your sanctuaries. Therefore, I have brought fire from the midst of you. It has consumed you. This is foreshadowing the end. And I have turned you to ashes on the earth and the eyes of all who see you. And we know that is at the second death. All who know you among the peoples are appalled at you. You have become terrified and you will cease to be forever. We know the fate of rebellion against God. We see it in Scripture. For anyone who wishes to follow their own ways, do their own will, to have their own freedom, there is no such thing. It all falls under sin. It, it all leads to a very dark place. We were all made for a purpose. Back then, when God created, even when he created Adam and Eve, and even when he looks at us. Ephesians 2, um, 10 says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. I hope everyone watching this remembers that God gave us talents that we were born with, and we have talents that we acquire from the Holy Spirit. These talents were never for us to think more of ourselves than we should, like Lucifer, they were given to us to do his good pleasure and to glorify his name. So I pray that, and my hope is that we all remember this. I mean, obviously God wants you to work and take care of yourself, but he also wants you to use the talents that he get, has given you 
for him. Scott? All right. <clears throat> the price of pride. So Wednesday's lesson um, has the, as the main theme uh, basically the idea of Babylon and how Babylon expressed the pride of the nations. Uh, and that's brought into contrast with Salem, Mount Zion, Jerusalem, and New Jerusalem, which represent God's kingdom. And Babel, Babylon... Uh, represent Satan's dominion. So I wanted to back up and go all the way back to the city of Babel. Um, so in Genesis chapter 11 at verse uh, 3, we'll start to read there. Then they said to each other, Come, let us make bricks. Let us break, uh, bake them thoroughly. Uh, they had brick for stone and they they asphalt for mortar. And then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. So here Ellen White comments, the dwellers of the plain of Shinar disbelieved God's covenant that he would not again bring a flood upon the earth. Many of them denied the existence of God and attributed the flood to the operation of natural causes. Others believed in a supreme being and that it was he who had destroyed the antediluvian world. And their hearts, like that of Cain, rose up in rebellion against him. One object before them was the erection of a tower to secure their own safety in case of another deluge. And now do we not see people today who want to uh, build up towers for themselves to escape the wrath of God, but that will not succeed. Um, so just like um, the the people of uh, Babel did not succeed in building the tower. Um, so then the, the lesson also talks about three times that God called people out of Babylon. So the first was Abram. Before he was even called Abraham, he was asked to move out of Ur of the Chaldees, which was essentially in the area where Babylon was. Then the Jews, after they were exiled in Babylon for their disobedience to God, they were asked to return. And the third time they're out, um, they're asked to come out of Babylon as um, the people of God in the end times are asked to come out of spiritual Babylon. And that one is in... Um, Revelation 18.4. Um, so actually, let me go to that Revelation 18.4 now. So it says, um, Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, lest you receive her of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Um, and then the commentary says, the last message uh, of Reve the Revelation 18 points to the time when, as a result of rejecting the threefold warning of Revelation 14, 6 through 12, the church will have fully reached the condition foretold by the second angel and the people of God still in Babylon will be called upon to separate from her communion. This message is the last that will ever be given to the world and it will accomplish its work. So now let's go back and talk a little bit about... So I think one of the things that Babylon and Lucifer and Nebuchadnezzar all had in common was their pride. So um, in Isaiah chapter 14, uh, it talks about basically the king of Babylon being humbled by God. Uh, and says, how, has, how the oppressor has ceased... The golden city has ceased. Um, the Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of the rulers. He who struck the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he who ruled over the nations in anger, is persecuted and no one hinders. The whole earth is at rest and quiet. They break forth into singing. Indeed, the cypress trees rejoice over you and the cedars of Lebanon saying, since you were cut down, no woodsman has come up against us. 
hell uh, beneath you, hell from beneath is excited about you to meet you at your coming. It stirs up the dead for you, all the chief ones of the earth. But then I, I'm going to skip forward to verse 11 where it says, your pomp is brought down to Sheol. Uh, and Sheol means the grave. And the sound of your stringed instruments, the mag maggot is spread under you and worms cover you. And then it goes into, um, so from the king of Babylon, it talks to who was behind the king of Babylon. Uh, all three Babylons, be, the, the Babylon during the time of Babel, who was Nimrod, he was a, a proud monarch. And then it, there was um, Nebuchadnezzar in the time of the Jews. And then there's the man of sin in the time of the end. But behind these is the fall of Lucifer himself. And it says, how, how are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations? For you said into your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the height of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you will be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Those who gaze at you will con and consider saying, Is this the man who made the earth to tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities, who did not open the house of the prisoners and all the kings and the nations, all of them sleep in glory, everyone in his own house, but you are cast out <coughs> of your grave like an abominable branch, like the garment of those who are slain and <coughs> thrust through with a sword, who go down to the stones of the pit like a corpse trodden underfoot. You will not be joined uh, in, with them in burial because you have destroyed your land and slayed your people. The brood of evildoers <coughs> shall never be named. People slaughter for his children uh, prepare slaughter for his children because of the iniquity of their fathers, lest they rise up and possess the land and fill the face of the earth uh, with cities. For I will rise up against them, says the Lord of hosts, and cut off Babylon, the name, and the remnant, and the offspring, and posterity. So, Essentially, I think this is talking against uh, the pride, both in, uh, in all three Babylons as well as in Lucifer himself. Uh, so pride in his own glory nourished his desire for supremacy. The high honors conferred upon Lucifer were not appreciated as a gift of God and called forth no gratitude from the Creator. He gloried in the brightness of his exaltation and aspired to be equal with God. He was beloved and reverenced by the heavenly host. Angels delighted to execute his commands, and he was clothed with wisdom and glory above them all. Yet the Son of God was the acknowledged sovereign of heaven, one in power and authority with the Father. In all the counsels of God, Christ was a participant while Lucifer was not permitted thus to enter into the divine purposes. Why, question this mighty angel, should Christ have the supremacy? Why is he thus honored above Lucifer? So then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip ahead in the interest of time and read the last paragraph that I had quoted here. This is all quotes from the great controversy. In dealing with sin, God could, only, could employ only righteousness and truth. Satan could use that which God could not, which is flattery and deceit. He had sought to falsify the word of God and had misrepresented his plan of government before the angels, claiming that God was not just in laying laws and rules upon the inhabitants of heaven and that in requiring submission and obedience from his creatures, he was seeking merely the exaltation of himself. Therefore, it must be demonstrated before the inhabitants of heaven as well as of all the worlds, that God's government was just, his law was perfect. Satan was, uh, made it appear that he himself was seeking to promote the good of the universe. The true character of the usurper and his real objects must be understood by all. He must have time, 
to manifest his wicked works, uh, manifest himself by his wicked works. So, in short, God gave Satan uh, time to prove his point, and also t for the universe to be able to see that um, they don't really want to follow Lucifer. So with that, we'll move on to he the gave, next day. They gave him a rope to hang himself. Exactly. <laughs> so, Elisa, the spread of unbelief. Yes. So in Monday's lesson, we had discussed the rebellion of Satan in heaven, and Isaiah 14 had told us that Satan fell from heaven and was cut down to the ground where he weakened the nations, referring to the destructive tactics on earth. Revelation 12 provides more details of the continued rebellion carried out on the earth between Satan and his fallen angels and Christ and his angels, and between the ungodly and God's true followers. Let's take a look at Revelation 12, 7 through 12. And it reads, And war broke out in heaven. Michael, who is Christ, and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. In summary, Revelation 12 tells us of this ongoing struggle, war, or controversy between good and evil. Some key points from Revelation 12 is that the ongoing struggle, or we often refer to as the great controversy, began in heaven with the rebellion of Lucifer and one-third of the heavenly angels. The war then culminated, or excuse me, culminated with Christ's decisive victory at the cross. And third, this struggle continues today against God's end-time church and his remnant people. Reflecting on the beginning of this controversy, Ellen White in the book Great Controversy states, God, in his great mercy, bore long with Lucifer. He was not immediately degraded from his exalted station when he first indulged the spirit of discontent, nor even when he began to present his false claims before the loyal angels. Long was he retained in heaven. Again and again, he was offered pardon on condition of repentance and submission." So if we reflect on the mercy and grace that God gave Lucifer, giving him time and opportunity to repent and submit to him, you know, ultimately, Satan hardened his heart and, was submitted, he, he, and submitted himself to full-blown rebellion. It was at this point that he and his angels were cast out of heaven. So what is this struggle like for you in your life? Are you submitting to God's will and his prompting? Or are you hardening your heart through procrastination or refusing to do what you know to be right? Listening to your own heart and its desires instead of what God is impressing upon you. So I'm going to leave with a final thought. And that is, um, Ellen White in her quote refers to Satan's first indulgence of discontent. He did not start with full-blown rebellion. That came over time as he gave into his discontented thoughts. Thoughts became actions and then influence over others. And so it is with us. In James 4, 7 to 10, it tells us, uh, it, it provides us wise counsel on how we can overcome our natural rebellious nature. And it says, 
Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Turn over to you to close. And actually, um, before we get to Scott, just something to add on Mm -hmm. to your day. In Spirit of Prophecy with Ellen White, after they'd been cast to the earth, Mm -hmm. says Satan stood in amazement at his new condition. His happiness was gone. He looked upon the angels who, with him, were once so happy, but who had been expelled from heaven with him. Before their fall, not a shade of discontent had marred their perfect bliss. Now all seemed changed. Continences, which had reflected the image of their maker, were gloomy and despairing. Strife, discord, and bitter recrimination were among them. Previous to their rebellion, these things had been unknown in heaven. Satan now beholds the terrible results of his rebellion. He shuddered and feared to face the future and to contemplate the end of these things. Sin's a heavy toll. Yeah, and, and that's, why, that's why here in, in James, it, it tells us, you know, be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. It's not that God wants us to live a life of gloom and doom. He wants us to consider our path that we're on and, you know, submit to him to correct the ways uh, that are error. And then it ends with that saying, after you've humbled yourself, the Lord will lift you up. Right. And give you that joy and that contentment. Not us. Yes. Scott, do you have any final thoughts? Yeah, I was going to say something along the lines of what you guys are both saying and that I think we need to all practice humility and that it seemed like the root of all sins is pride, essentially. Mm -hmm. So trying to think of yourself as better than other people. Um, So I think if we start with humbling ourselves before God, then I think God will lift us up. So Yeah, even envy has pride at the root. Um, Mm -hmm. And just real quick, one thing from the great controversy, Satan's rebellion was to be a lesson to the universe through all coming ages a perpetual testimony to the nature and terrible results of sin. The working out of Satan's rule, its effects upon both men and angels, would show what must be the fruit of setting aside the divine authority. It would testify that with the existence of God's government and his law is bound up, the well-being of all creatures he has made, thus the history of this terrible experiment of rebellion was to be a perpetual safeguard to all holy intelligences to prevent them from being deceived as to the nature of transgression to save them from committing sin and suffering its punishments can you imagine after 6,000 years if anyone a thought did a sin never did come into heaven again they're like no <laughs> No, look at the video. (laughs) So let us all remember why we were created, that we can be part of that harmonious world of God's perfection even now if we surrender and submit. And even though we live in a sinful world, as the phrase is, be in the world but not of it, let us always remember to choose his good will and pleasure in our daily lives. And we can't do that unless he's dwelling in us. So someday we can hear from Christ himself. Matthew 25, 21, his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful with a few things and I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. I hope we can all hear that someday. Let us pray. Our gracious heavenly father, Lord, we come to you We come to you as a broken people. We come to you with sinful, carnal natures. And Lord, it wasn't like this in the beginning. And you never intended it to be. There is no explanation why sin entered Lucifer's heart. 
Lord, but we do know that once sin is present, it loves company. Lord, we pray and we ask for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We pray and ask for the character of Christ Jesus. Lord, you are our only hope. Without you, Lord, we truly are lost to sin. You paid the ultimate price for each one of us. As we will see in lessons down the, low, uh, down the road, Lord, that you had to be that sacrifice. And Lord, that indicates truly that each and every one of us are priceless in your sight. Help us to remember this, Lord. Help us to stay to stay our desire for the temporal and to focus our, hinds, our eyes and our hearts on the spiritual, Lord, on your will and your way that we might surrender to you completely. And Lord, that we might be those sons and daughters of the living God here now and forever with you for all eternity. We thank you, Lord, and praise your glorious name. Amen. Happy Sabbath.